Well, happy 12, 12, 12, everybody. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I really am glad that we were able to. Yeah, thank you, thank you for coming. I, I feel very strongly, and now many of us were upstairs, and many of us who weren't upstairs have been upstairs. But one of the reasons why, uh, rather than doing something on the, the actual solstice on the 21st, uh, because it felt more about that seemed like a, a, an intimate time, a time to be with family, a time to be, uh, uh, as I say, intimate. But I, I became very fascinated with this particular time. And as I said in the, when I talked about what I wanted to talk about tonight, um, for many, many years, I've, ha I've had discussion groups here at the house for over 32 years. And I realized that really adds up to literally thousands of hours of discussion. Um, but this isn't just discussion. When we think about discussion, we realize it's energy. And when people come and join together exploring ideas with shared enthusiasm rather than shared judgment, when they do come together and say, what if we explore these ideas and quite literally give them residence? And that's why what we're experiencing here is quite literally residence. We're in a home. And I feel that this is a very important part of the metaphor here because our great question has been as human beings, well, how do we find home? We've been on a journey away from home for so long, looking for ourselves. How do we finally make sense of the sense that maybe it's to finally come to terms with we're here to be intimate finally. We're here to finally understand that what we are doing now, and this is why um, I wanted to bring up uh, the relationship to the Mayan calendar, ancient traditions. Like I had a theosophical discussion group here for 21 years, and that's the study of rounds and races and looking at, at really the, the Eastern esoteric uh, cosmologies and the great traditions and looking at the Maya cosmologies and these different cosmologies over the years really started to impress upon me, not the study of numbers, but the realization that we are part of something very vast, something quite profound and remarkable, and that what the ancients give us in terms of these ancient traditions is the, the sense that we are not here by chance, but that everything that we consider our own, that we think of as even now happens unconsciously for us, was at some point that which we needed to first make conscious. And that the question of being human is such a remarkable and such a great question that it couldn't be asked in any one form or any one period, but had to be asked across the ages. And this is one of the things that the Maya talk to us about now, is because they say that we are at the end of the 13th Bactum. We are ending a 5,125 year cycle. But even more exciting than that, it's the fifth of five cycles. So we're actually finishing a 26,000 year cycle. And this will start to, again, as I say, part of what we want to do now is to create context. Part of creating context and part of the great gift of the different traditions that said, look, if you look at the body of Brahma, you're looking at hundreds of millions, billions of years, the great breath. It's these enormous periods of time. And you think, well, why would we be studying that? And what that's trying to do is to liberate the ego, the sense of, of the small I, to realize that, no, actually, I am a season of being, but I am connected to a vast tree. And this was why it was called... Uh, a lot of times the, the, the human pilgrimage, the human, it was the, the, the story that we could not know who and what we were except by journeying across the ages. And that why this particular time, why the 3rd, the 12th, the 21st, and the 30th of this month are so very important to us, and I'll get into this with some of the slides, is that, that what we will see is that each of the, the 3, the 12, the 21, and the 30th all add up to 11, numerologically. 11 is a master number, meaning that it's not simply 2, 1, and 1. It's the 1 above and the 1 below. So it's the relationship of the microcosm and the macrocosm in union. What we see, and it's quite profound because a bit like looking at a, at a, um, 
you know, a, like a bicycle lock where you're looking at the numbers, that, that the Maya talked about that, that we began with the, the numbers all in the same position. And they basically then rolled out into all these other positions. But they're returning now to lining up. And that's what we will see, is that the 3rd, the 12th, the 21st, and the 30th are each uh, separated by nine-day intervals. Well, nine is the number of completion. It's also in the tarot the number of the hermit. And the hermit, the saying of the hermit in my book is from Rilke, who says, I wish to be with those who know secret things or else alone. And that's very indicative of where we are right now, because a lot of... You know, if you think about like an aperture in a camera, you, you, you're not, it's not something. You're literally a, a, a aligning different elements to create a type of resonance, a type of attractor field. And this is what the Maya were doing, what the pyramid builders were doing, that we externalized into the building of pyramids this relationship, uh, and in ancient times it was called geomancy. It was the, the magic of planetary alignment and that why the ancient sites are all built in relationship to Orion, to Sirius, why they are uh, the footprint on the Earth of this celestial map is that this was how we tuned the radio, literally through pattern recognition. In physics, we call this the grand attractor, the, 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 the story that everything is basically in response to a pattern, whether it's very small or very large, it's the same pattern, the same fractal, repeating itself. This was the wisdom of the Maya and the wisdom of this period because it's starting to say that we are a fractal, meaning that we have been cultivating in this knowledge of who and what we are a fractal sense that brings us, as I say, to these four uh, particular days because they will show us that they're literally from nine intervals of nine building a base of four. And if you think about a cube of space, if you think about moving from 11, 11, 11, 11, why that becomes important is we basically see what is known as the house or the indwelling of spirit, the cube of space. What this is telling us in terms of, of, of metaphysics, in terms of these deeper traditions, is that as we stand now at this particular moment as human species, not as just individuals, but really as a species, we are at a point where we are transitioning away from a reactive paradigm, meaning defining ourselves by what we're against, reacting to the bad ideas of others, and therefore trying to create a template where we are dealing with the lesser of two evils often. And what this is, is saying is we're actually now at the point where Consciousness is saying, give me material to work with. Tell me the story you want to be told. And that's what this is. That's what Olandar is. That's what everything, that's why this dream really began on 9-11 when the towers came down. Because I had a Noah moment. I thought, I can't convince the world that is pulling itself apart to not pull itself apart. I can't tell others that they're, they're wrong or that they're, because it's just going to be a shouting match. I have to say, what are the stories I want to share with generation? What are the stories I want to share with my daughters? What is it that I feel ennobles the human spirit? And that's why one of the things I feel very strongly is that in the arts, in the creative story, in theater, we never want to tell each other what to believe or how to believe or that you have to believe. What we want to do is to create the circumstances where we stimulate in one another the sense that we can tell a more interesting story. And one of the, the things you'll see is Olandar Foundation for Emerging Renaissance, which I created a number of years ago. And the acronym, interestingly enough, is OFFER, which I didn't know at the time. But this story of OFFER, this sense of, of foundation for emerging renaissance, I, I realize now that the emerging renaissance is not a style, a form. It's actually the invigoration of enthusiasm. And we think of the word entheos, enthusiasm, in God, meaning that when we are enthusiastic, we amplify, we increase the waves. You know, if you think from a physics point of view, usually we're busy canceling out each other's waves. And if we think of the creative psyche, the way we've been, as I say, hobbled for a very long time, we go very far out of our way to sabotage our own waves. 
We go very far out of our way to convince ourselves why a sense of wonder or possibility really isn't realistic. And if we think of that not just in a personal point, but we start to think of that in a planetary point, we've been a species that has always found a reason why not to not do it. And what I've always loved about the heroic nature of those that we really stand on the shoulders of now is that they still, in the darkness of their age, said yes when the world said yikes. They still said, I must, even if the world says, no, you must not. And when we understand that this is our bodies, that we are ancient and we are heroic, and that the questions that we embody now as human beings, of all of us sitting here, why we think we're together tonight, what I would like to really offer is that we are not just here tonight in these bodies, but these bodies are like ancient, ancient trees that say you are actually vibrating out of this great question, can we develop a consciousness that allows me to retain the sense that I am uniquely myself, and at the same time then realize that I live in a shared reality of shared energy? To me, this is the conscious actor, meaning the conscious actor says, I will not over-identify with the role, I will allow the energies to move through me, and I realize the play is the thing. Because at the end of the day, if you're acting with somebody, you want to bring out the best of their performance. And how do you do that? Generosity. You do it without a thought of yourself. You do it with that sense of, yes, together, we can amplify and bring out that which alone we don't even know is possible. And that's why tonight, I really feel that a lot of what I would like to have us do is just to start giving ourselves permission, like a theater game. I like this story better. I like this version of being human better. And that's why what I did when I put together the slides that I want to share with you, I just tried to contextualize a lot of what's been going on here over the years. Because what we see when we come here now is a life of work. Do you know, that's why it's overwhelming. It's, I've had a lifetime to do it. Do you know, it's not a few years. It's, it's, it's decades now. But I think that that's very important because the alchemists call themselves celestial gardeners. And the key to the alchemy was the realization that nothing of lasting value is brought about by an incomplete proposition. That everything that lasts is grown. So everything that we do is to plant a seed of intention. And that's why I feel tonight, and I'd like to do a little, just a, not a, a huge ritual, but a little invocation at the end tonight, because I feel a lot of what we're doing is understanding, like gardeners, because think about falling in love. We never figured out how to do that. We don't even know what love is, really. We find that mystery absolutely unbelievable, absolutely transformative. And yet we never know what it is. And we start to then think about the human question. Everything that is truly magnificent in our humanity, we can never actually figure out. And we can never reduce to true or false, yes or no. It is always that which creates ensemble, creates a sense of shared capacity. And that's the story that, that I'm going to dive into now because I put together here uh, on, in the beginning just some of the quotes that I have found uh, very much resonate with. And, and I wanted to bring up, because we have a misunderstanding of the ancients and the knowledge of the mysteries and the knowledge of Plato and the knowledge of what this mind was, really up until the Renaissance. We have a very modern, mechanistic, scientistic mind, meaning that our mind is based on proof. Can you prove it? Is it repeatable? There's the Book of God, which says you must repeat this in terms of how this book says, and the Book of Nature, which says these are the laws and principles. But what the ancients and what Plato was talking about, and what we'll see with Pythagoras, as well, is that the science of the ancient, the science of the alchemist, was not based in the second principle of math and division and equations. It was based in the first principle of life, of creation. This is why art allows us, because that's also the act of creation, to see truths about ourselves that we can't see when we're looking at bottom lines about statistics and what we're told, this is how you are and who and how you're supposed to be. Take this drug, it'll help. Um, and and this, this vision is revealed to him of a single science, which is the science of beauty everywhere. 